Professor Nav Kapoor. Nav is Professor of Psychiatry and Population Health at the University of Manchester uh, and an honorary consultant psychiatrist at Greater Manchester Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust. He spent uh, most of the last 20 years uh, researching suicidal uh, behaviour, particularly its causes, uh, treatment and prevention, including as head of uh, research uh, at the National Confidential uh, Inquiry into Suicide and Safety in Mental Health. He's a member of the Department of uh, Health uh, England's National Suicide Prevention Strategy Advisory Group and is currently helping to lead a national quality improvement project to prevent uh, suicide. So over to you, Nav, who is going to talk to us about suicide in middle-aged men. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, Kate. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, sunny Manchester. Uh, this is the university campus this morning uh, behind me. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not speaking to you in person, um, of course, but we have, uh, I think, 560 odd people uh, on uh, uh, on this event and, and so we'll, we'll definitely need a bigger venue uh, next year. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, so, so as usual, um, I'm going to be uh, talking um, about work uh, carried out by our fantastic team um, and the particular people who, who led on this uh, are Cathy Broadway, uh, Jane Graney and Sue Guantam, uh, but then many others who have contributed to this work. Um, and it's really focusing on um, suicide um, uh, in middle-aged men. Um, so why are we um, interested in this group? Um, well, um, the reason is right here on this slide. Um, so they're now the group, the gray bars on the slide, they're now the group with the highest rates of suicide in the UK, men in their 40s and 50s. And one of the things that's quite interesting is if I'd been um, sat here uh, talking to you 20 or 30 years ago, it wouldn't be this group I'd be talking about as having high rates of suicide. It would have been this younger group in their 20s. So 20 to 30 years later, it's not the group in their 20s I'm talking about, it's the group in their 40s and 50s. And, and part of what might be going on here is something we call a cohort effect. Um, so uh, that group of younger men uh, carrying their vulnerabilities with them um, as they uh, go into middle age. So, so the cohort effect, and we might pick up uh, possible reasons for that um, during the discussion. The other thing about this slide, of course, is the much higher rates of suicide in men than women. The gray bar there is the rates in men, um, the dark bar there uh, are the rates in women, uh, three times as many men um, uh, in their lives as um, women. So that, that's why we're interested in this group. Um, why, why do men have higher uh, rates of suicide than women? Well, part of it is um, probably to do with the methods uh, that men use. When men hurt themselves, they tend to use more um, dangerous methods to do so. But part of it's also to do with the risk factors uh, that men have. So uh, this is a recent uh, systematic review from colleagues in Glasgow, and I like it best of all uh, because of this thing. It's, a, it's called a bubble chart. Um, and uh, what's the bottom line? Well, bottom line is uh, of all the studies that have been published, you know, here is some of the kind of common risk factors that have been identified in studies, things you might expect, alcohol and drugs, uh, being unmarried um, is a risk factor for men um, and psychiatric illness, particularly depression increases suicide risk in men. So there, there's some of, the, if you like, the risk factor reasons um, for why uh, rates might be um, higher in men. But, but what part of the story also is help seeking. So, um, you know, there lots of researchers um, identified men perhaps not seeking help as readily as women, perhaps having more negative attitudes towards mental health. Um, and our own work um, showing that um, uh, in men, sometimes the economic factors might be more, um, more important than the clinical ones. So we've got the risk factors, we've got help seeking, um, but the policy response has been good, I think. You know, so uh, men, men in midlife have been identified as a, a policy priority in the suicide prevention strategies in the, in the long-term plan. And also in the quality improvement um, program that we're working on with, with many of the people actually who are on, uh, on this event, on this call, uh, you, you work with us closely, uh, really trying to implement the evidence into frontline services. And mid, men in midlife, middle-aged men are one of the three 
priority areas in this quality improvement program. So lots of activity um, in the area of priority group. So what were we trying to do uh, in this study? Well, in this study, we were looking at, um, we wanted to identify the characteristics of middle-aged men who die by suicide, thinking about specific events, thinking about clinical factors that might have been implicated, implicated thinking about how they used um, support services and actually making some clinical recommendations uh, to help strengthen suicide prevention. Um, so the important point here is, is this was a study of all middle-aged men, not just uh, middle-aged men in contact with mental health service. So unlike uh, our report, this is um, you know, a study of middle-aged men in the general population. Um, so this is what we did. Basically, we went again to official uh, uh, statistics. Um, we took a random sample of men um, who died, um, and then we um, uh, obtained lots of uh, information on those individuals who, who died, mostly from coroner's reports, but also from police, uh, criminal justice reports, NHS uh, data as well. And then our great research team um, examined all that information in detail and extracted um, the relevant information. So a detailed study, but a general population study. Um, so uh, we carried it out um, for deaths that occurred in 2017, so we had a full calendar year. During that year, around 1,500 men, you know, again, you know, Lewis has talked a lot about, you know, the shocking toll here and, you know, each of these um, uh, behind, you know, each of these statistics is an individual with a family, we, we never forget that. Um, and we selected 20% of those men to uh, look at the antecedents in detail. And we actually got information on um, uh, a, large, uh, a large proportion. That's for, so for 80%, we had um, relevant information. So what did we find? Well, if we think about the, the known risk factors, first of all, so some of the risk factors um, in that review, um, we're looking um, uh, at, the at people's marital status. Of the men, about 40% were single um, and a further 21% uh, um, were either divorced or separated. So, you know, being unmarried, um, uh, uh, an important factor here, um, as was um, the other factors, you know, so alcohol and drug misuse in almost 50% of men who died, um, uh, affective disorder, so it's both depression and bipolar affective disorder in about 30%. So um, these figures are about uh, between two and four times higher uh, than what you'd expect in the general population. So they are, it, although this wasn't a risk factor study, you know, these are likely to be risk factors. So confirming, you know, what other studies have found, but also found, finding some things that perhaps we, we weren't expecting to find. So one in five of these men, men in midlife who died by suicide had a history of violence. Um, and in, in one in 10, it was a history of domestic violence and a further 7% were actually uh, the victims of domestic violence. So 10% were perpetrators of domestic violence and 7% were the victims of domestic violence. A third uh, of the men had experienced bereavement, most uh, commonly parental bereavement, um, but one in six, one in six of these individuals had experienced suicide bereavement. Rather interestingly, rather like the um, uh, in, in younger people, the data Lewis presented earlier, 15% um, there was some evidence of suicide related internet use. And in the majority of these cases, it was searching, um, you know, searching for things like methods of suicide. 15% so suicide related internet use. And over half of men um, had a physical health problem. So those are th some uh, things you might expect, some things you might not, um, but also uh, a combination of long-standing risks, so things like family history of physical or mental illness, um, you know, um, we've already heard about the potential very negative impact of, uh, you know, early childhood experiences, so 3% um, having experienced um, uh, negative experiences in childhood, another 4% having experienced um, uh, some form of abuse, so important facts. So these long-standing risk factors, but also with the long-standing risk factors, um, more recent events. So, you know, um, uh, interpersonal problems, problems with families and relationships in over a third of people, um, but, but also socioeconomic recent events, you know, that's come up in um, Lewis's talk as well. Almost a third had housing problems as a kind of recent event. Um, almost a third had financial problems. And in half of these um, people, it was actually related to gambling. I know gambling's come up in, in the chat and in some of the Q&A. So about half of um, the people with financial problems had um, um, 
problems related to gambling, but also um, another quarter of people had uh, problems related to work. So the socioeconomic factors uh, were really important. What about help seeking? Well, help seeking, you know, one of the stories out there is men don't seek help from services, but in fact, 90% um, of people had some history of service contact um, at some point. So only 9% had no history of ser service contact. And in two thirds of men who had died, that contact had been fairly recent, it had been within three months of death. Um, and in a third of men, it had been in the week before death. And a wide variety of services, you know, eight out of 10 having seen their GP, half having seen mental health services, half having seen mental health services, the emergency department, the justice, uh, criminal justice system, third sector. So, you know, lots of different agencies who they may have come in contact with. And about a fifth of men were in contact with multiple agencies. Just thinking about something we've, we've talked a lot about in recent years, and it's risk. Um, so of the sample, the, um, you know, over 200, about in, in about 70, just under 70, there was a rating of risk documented that we could find. But what's interesting is in 80% of these men who had died who had a rating of risk, the risk was viewed as low or not present the last time they'd been seen. So we've talked about the low risk paradox a lot over the years. But let's just have a look at these men who uh, it was documented they were at low risk. Two thirds had a history of alcohol and drug misuse. 70% uh, nearly had a history of self-harm and 70% had expressed suicidal ideation or intent. So you look at that and you ask yourself, are these really low risk men? What's going on? Is it simply that the risk has changed? Is it that our risk assessments aren't fit for purpose? I mean, it might be a bit of that, but this is probably another example of how certainly mental health services risk barometers kind of a reset. So basically everyone uh, who's seen by mental health services, many middle-aged men uh, are at high risk, but, but if you like, we, did, we kind of tend to downgrade the risk. But again, we may pick that up in the discussion. Just very quickly, just kind of what are the take-home messages? I mean, one of the take-home messages is that the risk factors are both long-standing and more recent. So we, we talk about this model of cumulative risks. So you've got long-standing risks from childhood. You've got things that happen to you uh, through your life. And then you've got, if you like, uh, recent stresses and antecedents. And, and if you think about the prevention uh, messages, they, they're different at each of them. So, you know, family and parenting support, uh, economic uh, uh, economic kind of mitigation effects and access to services and then ready access to crisis support. So this model of cumulative risk. But I mean, one of the things to really for this study is that rates of contact were higher than we expected. And, and one of the things we, I think, need to move away from, of course, we need to be in touch with the men who aren't in touch with the services. And I know many of you as part of the quality improvement work are doing brilliant things uh, to get in touch with men who aren't in contact. But for those who are, we really need to make services fit for purpose. So it's no good, you know, that they're, they're in contact. We need to engage men. We need to make them uh, services um, fit for purpose. And again, we might pick up how we do that in the discussion. We need to kind of adapt interventions to suit men, men's needs. There's, there's messages in the report. There's much more detail in the report about safer prescribing. Um, psychological therapies need to be suited to the needs. So 5% of men, 5% of men who died were... Uh, had received psychological therapy, we're receiving psychological therapy, 50% uh, receiving antidepressants, you might argue that that's, uh, that's not an appropriate balance. So thinking about how we can um, tailor psychological therapies um, to men, and also this idea of, you know, recognising risk and responding appropriately. There's no such thing really as, as low risk, it's, it's about providing something for everyone. Um, other, other things, again, more detail in the report, providing bereavement support uh, for uh, the one third of men who are bereaved prior to dying by suicide. Thinking about online safety. So online safety isn't just about young people. Um, it's about people across the lifespan. But also thinking about uh, prevention requiring a range of socioeconomic um, interventions have talked about the role of deprivation um, and wider um, interventions as well. So, you know, that, that high proportion of men who are either um, perpetrators or victims of domestic violence. So thinking beyond uh, traditional suicide prevention interventions. Um, now, I've intentionally not mentioned uh, COVID-19 or the pandemic um, throughout this talk, but I'm going to mention it now. Uh, one of the things I think we're worried about quite rightly is the effect of uh, the pandemic and the mitigation measures on the mental health of younger people. Uh, but this was an Institute of Fiscal Studies report that came out last week, which 
actually worryingly suggested that some of the big economic impacts um, of all this might be felt uh, by older workers, some of whom are in middle age. So really important uh, to keep uh, an eye uh, on this. Um, and that's a reminder to me that now we're going to move uh, to the panel discussion. So uh, thank you for listening and I'll stop sharing my screen now.